Protestants for the Pope. <clears throat> we see that a Protestant Baptist president invited the Pope to do the Mass on the White House lawns. He was invited before the United Nations. Here he is with Kurt Waltheim, the secretary at that time. And there before the United Nations, he revealed his Marxist beliefs. The Plain Truth magazine put out in that year says that during the 62-minute discourse at the General Assembly, the Pope shed, as it were, his clerical garb and displayed his humanistic side. He interposed his carefully chosen words with patently Marxist egalitarian themes. Murray Kempton of the New York Post said, the Pope aligned himself in spirit with the demands of the developing nations for the restructuring of the world economic order. That's a tremendous statement. And look what's going on in black Africa. When the Pope visited Africa, they even changed the color of Christ. There, when the Pope got back from the meetings there in Africa, he said that Catholicism in Africa is Africa. The church is taking over the third world communist countries today. Prelates are now all of an ethnic nature and in time there is a hope and a plan that a man of an ethnic nature will become the Pope and thus the third world, the largest part of our world as far as the masses of mankind will identify with the Vatican. Today this Pope has brought this uh, man, Gantin, into a promotional position second in line to the papal seat. We read here that during the papal visit to Benin two years ago, it was Gantin who received the most rousing cheers from one welcoming crowd. John Paul's increasing trust in his African aid was acknowledged last week when Gantin, in a major reshuffle of the papal staff, was promoted to one of these most important posts in the Vatican. As he went to Central America, here he lent his speeches to the communist revolution that were taking place there. The, parable, the peril of such interpretation is portentous. It puts the kingdom of God in the near future just beyond the fast approaching Catholic Marxist revolution. The spirit of these biblical Marxist Leninist oriented quotations has already impregnate, impregnated the whole fabric of the Latin American church. From Tierra del Fuego to the borders of the U.S. scattered all along the continent, there are, under, there are undetermined battalions of missionary priests, nuns, lay workers, preaching and practicing a combination of the tenets of liberation theology and the neo-Marxian Catholic Catholicism of Pope John Paul II. Brethren, there's a revolution moving towards our, our, our borders today. Their commanders as a rule were and are the Jesuits or Jesuit-inspired priests or lay workers, something which Pope John Paul II discovered to his astonishment when the U.S. intelligence apparatus denounced them as the main instigators of the guerrilla opposition, guerrilla's opposition mostly against Latin American administration, financed and, and militarily supported by the U.S. Individual Jesuit at times acknowledged their involvement in the revolution. Father Louis Pelicer, for instance, when he testified in San Salvador, December 12, 1981, before an audience of diplomats and newsmen, admitted that he had served an active guerrilla group for almost 15 years. That's clear back to, at this point, when this was published, that would be clear back from 1965. They have been leading out in the communist revolution of Central America. He stated that he had joined the guerrillas in Guatemala, and from there he had helped to prepare the ground for the guerrillas in El Salvador. Every Jesuit in Central America, he commented, is actively serving God, not God, but Marxism and revolution. That is from the book, The Vatican, Washington, Moscow Alliance by Avril Manhattan. Get it, brethren, and read that book and be aware of the rise of Catholicism today in politics. As we visited the ancient center of the Waldensian religion in Torre Police, we were disappointed there for three days. The these uh, former Christians, now still calling themselves Wallensies and the Catholics, were carrying on a communist rally for three days called Ilionita, singing Marxist uh, hymns. And you can see the, 
the, uh, the sickle and the hammer there as their symbol. Christians have become communists in this world and it's the biggest movement taking place. In the countries that Jim and I pass through in our traveling, we're constantly faced with this type of thing. Clear out on the island of Patmos, they were having a communist Christian rally there, the Greek Orthodox Church. Brethren, we are not aware of what's taking place. We have been blind for too long. This Pope has captured the hearts of the world. The world is now wondering after the beast. If there is any time, the healing of the wound is taking place now. And friends, the power, once it is gained again, will result in mass persecution. President Reagan recognizes the power of the Roman papacy and that 25% of the American populace is Roman Catholic in votes. Avery Manhattan's book, Catholic Power Today, page 129, tells us the Catholic Church is the largest church in the United States of America. Ecclesiastically, she is the best organized. Financially, she is on a par with any of the giant trusts or corporations of America. Indeed, should the occasion arise, she could stand up to all of them collectively. Politically, she is looming ever larger at the White House. She is a power in the Senate, a force at the Pentagon, an invisible agent at the FBI and the most subtly intangible prime mover of the wheel within the wheel of the United States of America, the Central Intelligence Agency. This again, Ever Manhattan's book, page 129. There is a reason why Ronald Reagan is behind something that the American people were shocked about. A U.S. and Vatican forming a link. Here we find that it was uh, it wasn't the last official Vatican ambassador was in 1867. And remember that during this time there was a revolution taking place in Italy. The Pope was moved out of his political poli position and there was confusion brought in. But America had not fully forgotten the responsibility of the Roman Catholic Church in the war between the states. For all this time, for 117 years, we have held off our connection with that power. And now, U.S. Vatican re resumes full diplomatic ties. What does it say? The step announced here at the Vatican was described by officials of the Reagan administration as an attempt to improve communications at a time when Pope John Paul has become increasingly involved in international affairs. What's happening in our affairs here in the United States? The Protestants have been consistently moving into the arena of politics. There is a revival of religion in legislature today. Many of the old concepts that were revived before, men have forgotten that they were religious. A one world judicial court was fomented by the National Federation of Churches, the National Council of Churches. Social security was a religious issue. And now many religious issues are covering the, the, the books of law today. What's going to happen as a president in this country has to capitulate to the religious forces? We read on April 23, 1984 in Spotlight magazine, Reagan orders concentration camps. Mass detention facilities, otherwise known as concentration camps, are being set up at a number of major U.S. military installations on the secret orders of President Ronald Reagan. The spotlight has learned that on April 5, the White House issued a highly classified national security decision. The first roundup and publicly announced one will be of illegal aliens and refugees. A military source told Spotlight, but under the secret provisions of Rex 84, there will be also broad arrests of security suspects who can be held in these centers under this emergency order whether they're US citizens or not. And this is the thing that alarms me. It says according to these sources the primary goal of the vast police operation condemned by Rex 84 is to detain and deport illegal immigrants. But these sources say Rex 84 has another even more closely guarded and carefully orchestrated objective to apply the so-called capture and custody measures against political opponents, resistors, or even outspoken critics whom the administration considers dangerous. We know that recently President Reagan met with the Pope in Alaska and there he assured the Pope that we would become involved in world projects with the Roman Catholic Church. What if our country 
our legislature becomes so increasingly involved with religion and politics that it recognizes the message of God through the Adventist people as a challenge to that power. We'll be put in concentration camps. Ellen White tells us in Great Controversy, page 564 and 571, let the restraints now imposed by secular governments be removed and Rome be reinstated in her former power and there would speedily be a revival of her former tyranny and persecution. The Protestant churches are in great darkness or they would discern the signs of the times. The Protestant church is far reaching in her plans and modes of operation. She is employing every device to extend her influence and increase her power in preparation for a fierce and determined conflict to regain control of the world. To reestablish persecution and to undo all that Protestantism has done. She has clothed herself in Christ-like garments, but she is unchanged. Every principle of the papacy that existed in past ages exists today. The doctrines devised in the darkest ages are still held by her. Her spirit is no less cruel and despotic now than when she crushed out human liberty and slew the saints of the Most High. It is a part of her policy to assume the character which will best accomplish her purpose. But beneath the invariable appearance of the chameleon, she conceals the invariable venom of the serpent. Folks, it doesn't make any difference what face she presents before the world. It could be claiming to forgive her assassin. It could be claiming to feed the poor. It could be anything, but God has shown us under inspiration that the plan is to paralyze mankind into not seeing her as dangerous when she plans their destruction. The churches in this world, <clears throat> the spirit of prophecy tells us, still house beneath them dungeons. Places where in the past torture was carried out and implements of torture. And we understand again by the spirit of prophecy that those tortures will be resumed again whenever she has her opportunity. Brethren, we face a serious decision. We face a having to give up our life in this world to do God's will. Every major destroying movement from the turn of the century and even before the great wars were an effort by this demonic power to regain possession of the entire world. And brethren, the piece of cake today is much bigger than it has ever been before. If she could ride upon the nations and control them, she would never again fall. And she believes that she'll do that. In Revelation, she, we read that she says, I sit a queen. And she doesn't believe that she'll ever see that sorrow again. How will she accomplish it in this age? I'd like to read to you from Education by Ellen G. White, page 227 and 228. Spiritualism asserts that men are unfallen demagogues, that each mind will judge itself, that true knowledge places men above all law, that all sins committed are innocent, for whatever is, is right, and God doth not condemn. Brethren, this is the teachings of the occult world. These were the teachings that Adam Weiss helped and his co-conspirator Jesuits and others that were brought into the Luciferian conspiracy taught that brought about the destruction of France and the revolution spreading to the world. 